short of time, what we do is a quick round mm -hmm. where everybody just tries to keep it brief and um, way forward. That is what we'll focus on. And my first question again, Dr. Ramasubramaniam, is you've been in the community, you've been active with the community mental health, uh, running a very successful trust. And uh, so what, what are your solutions? How do we have more community involvement? What kind of models will work? And if you can just briefly give us some views on what is the way forward in involving the community in the mental health care and services. In fact, I have already told you that all psychiatric illnesses treatable, curable, and preventable. In the past 20 years, there is a silent revolution is going on in the field of psychiatry. Now we have found out the root cause or basic mechanism of etiology of psychiatric illness. The psychiatric illness is nothing but the disequilibrium or disturbances in the neurotransmitters which is secreted inside the brain. My dear friends, we are, we are just like a computer. But what is the difference between the computer and the human being? We have got emotions. And we have got different parts of brain. And every part of brain has got its own function. We have got a front portion. That's a frontal lobe. It is a planning and judgment. And the side portion, there is a temporal lobe. It is a memory. Back portion, it is a vision. And the middle portion, it is a uh, emotions. So every lobe has got a different function. And how the, all these lobes are connected, it is because of the neurotransmitters which is secreted inside the brain. Unfortunately, for some people, there will be a depletion of secretion of the neurotransmitters. There is a decreased amount of secretions of neurotransmitters. The neurotransmitters are popularly known as the dopamine and serotonin. If there is a depleted amount of dopamine or neurotransmitters, the individual becomes dull, lethargic, and he will harbor all sorts of negative ideas. A person who has got uh, the various facilities but he will develop ideas of hopelessness, worthlessness, and guilt feeling. And for some people, there is an excess amount of secretion of dopamine or neurotransmitters. These patients, and they will be hyperactive, excessive talk, grandiose ideas, they will boastful. So now you can imagine, if the patient is hyperactive, there is a dopamine secretion. If the, pa the patient is dull, lethargic, there is a depletion amount of do dopamine. So the management is very simple. How to manage? Suppose if the patient is hyperactive, decrease the dopamine, we have got plenty of, in the ornamentarium of psychiatry, we have got plenty of drugs which decreases the dopamine. Suppose if the patient is dull, increase the dopamine. We have got drugs to increase the dopamine. See, for the whole treatment process of psychiatry, the whole treatment process of psychological one, it becomes very easy. We have got a battery of drugs, anxiety drug, depression drug, mania drug, schizophrenia drugs. But unfortunately, for want of manpower, for want of infrastructure facilities, and high cost of treatment, psychiatric treatment drugs are very costly. And also stigma, and the people are to long distance to travel, and all these things, makes these families or communities, they are not seeking the psychiatric help. So how to overcome this problem? I have already told you, it is a treatable, curable, and preventable. And I have already told you, the treatment process is very simple. Hyperactive, decrease the dopamine. Hyperactive, increase the dopamine. So such a simple treatment, such an efficient treatment, so how to deal with such a problem means, if you are going to wait to produce psychiatrists, I'll have to wait at least another century to meet the whole problem. So we can educate the primary health doctors or MBBS doctors in treating the psychiatric illness. And above all, your role is very, very important. You should understand how to identify the illness and also you can spread the message to the community. All psychiatric illnesses are treatable, curable and preventable. There are doctors, there are facilities. <coughs> If you utilize these facilities, 
the recovery will be total. My dear friends, in all the disabilities, if you want to punish anybody, if you create a psychiatric patient, the entire family suffers. In the physical disability, if, you, if a person is having a visual disability, only the individual suffers. If the person has a physical disability, the individual suffers. Only in the psychiatric disability, the entire family suffers. The individual, they are living in their own world of imagination, fantasy. They are forgetting about the past. They don't have the, any inclination about the future. And the present, there is a nightmare for the families. So it is your duty. See, the seminars, uh, the important concept of the seminars is sensitizing you all the people about the basic psychiatric illness. Isn't it? So, if the community involved, it is not a problem of Dr. Prasad Rav or Dr. CRS or Karthian Sir or the panelists. It is a community problem. It is a society's problem. We should make it a social moment. We should make it as a community moment. If we all combine together, if you are going to give a helping hand, Definitely, we can address this problem permanently. Thank you. Thank you, sir, for your words. That, uh, thank you. Uh, yes, I think, uh, I think what hinders the whole idea of this long-term treatment for mental illness and how it's a burden is that because it deals with the mind, as opposed to the other uh, illnesses where it deals with different parts of the body, and somehow we are <coughs> fearful of something that affects the mind for so many years. And I think probably it comes from that. And um, next, uh, I would like to ask uh, Abdesh that what about, uh, you know, we talk about alternative systems and there are other people who are also seeing people with mental illness. There are other systems of treatment. There are other um, practices like uh, people seeking help from astrologers to spiritualists to faith healers. So is there some way we can integrate something? Is there some way we can see that uh, they don't ca cause more harm to our patients or uh, clients? Or is there some way we could work in a public education way to integrate this? Is it possible at all? And just a few words on the way forward for this. I thought being my wife, you'll be kind to me. <laughs> it's one of the toughest questions especially when you have three such strong advocates of medicine, and I'm the fourth advocate of medication, when it is appropriate. And I think that's the key. If you were to see what is happening, Dr. Ramsubramaniam, I'll uh, seek your indulgence, Rajesh. Uh, if you were to see what is happening at this point of time in the society, there are people with mental illnesses, there are a number of psychiatrists who are giving the best services that are possible. But a question that I often keep asking myself is, what is happening to the rest of the people who are not getting the treatment that they should be getting? I think what is happening is that at some level, uh, many of them are dying, many of them are suffering, but many of them are trying to look at alternatives. If we were all, and, and I'm talking about a utopian dream, if we were all to sit down together, thrash out through research and consensus building, which particular problem is best handled by whom? Then we will solve the problem that is there of resources as well. We know, for example, like Rajesh said, let's differentiate between major and minor mental problems. Uh, let's talk about not depression as one entity, because there are very mild, fleeting depressions, which could be more like sadness or in response to a situation. Um, and there are clinical depressions which need immediate help. Uh, if we were to say that there are certain treatments, the so-called alternatives, which incidentally till 50 years back were the mainstream medication. Ayurveda was the mainstream treatment till 50 years back. Today it has been replaced. I would say that if you were to look at all the systems that are available, modern medicine gives you the best possible rates of improvement for major psychiatric illnesses. The other systems of medicine for certain problems like insomnia, for fleeting anxiety, uh, for interpersonal issues, uh, you can have very good meditative lifestyles. You could have so-called energy healings. 
uh, you could have systems of yoga, uh, certain techniques, and you have certain organizations which may be giving you information on better ways of living. They could also be used as preventive strategies. And there is an increasing body of evidence which is talking about meditation as a form of medication in minor mental health issues. Um, also for building uh, resilient personalities. Also for improving the well-being of people. Many of the medication may bring you to a level where the symptoms are not there. But the next step of health, of positivity, of well-being is where all these things come in. So possibly we could have a combination. It may not be an alternate. It may be a combination appropriately. And very, very importantly that even for major mental illnesses, especially their family members, who may be also going through equal form of stress, that is a large population which is missed out. For them, mainstream medication may not be required, but these may be required. So I think at some point of time, uh, maybe through us in professional bodies, or maybe from the government, which has Ayush and modern medicine going simultaneously, uh, we could have a one-day seminar on this, what works best for whom, so that we don't waste resources. I don't waste my resources in seeing people who have only insomnia or who are fighting with each other. Let somebody else handle it. I only handle person with schizophrenia, for example. So I think when that happens, uh, but there is robust evidence for all these therapies, except possibly where people are exploited, which also happens, uh, especially uh, in faith healing, that happens, especially when some people go for religious spiritual practices and uh, they are for long period of times are not allowed to take the mainstream medication. I think that's also a kind of an exploitation that all must stop, uh, but wherever it is appropriate uh, for certain symptoms, if not disorders, they can be quite useful. Thank you. So the key is how the other side can cooperate, collaborate, understand, and work with the professionals of mental health. And if we can achieve that, we are move forward. Uh, we, are, we are helping the population at large. Uh, Dr. Belinda, you have worked with so many uh, international um, setups in, as an, in your capacity as a chief of an uh, international aid organization. So how can the NGO sector, the, um, the civil society, can yeah. help to uh, bring about change in the way we perceive a mental illness and the way we seek treatment and help? Um, thank you, Sujata. Um, I would like to, you know, uh, when you look at some of the public policies like uh, domestic violence or uh, right to information, that all came from public pressure from the grassroots, which made the government to enact certain uh, progressive policies. But when it comes to mental health, uh, I don't think uh, international organizations have any pressure. In the last 12 years living in Delhi, only I think myself and Avdesh every now and then we have a conversation about how do we galvanize um, you know, the ability of international NGOs to work on the issue. So that is one thing. Maybe as a way forward, I would like to suggest, uh, Avdesh, you were mentioning an uh, international event is happening in Cochin from two years from now. No, is it? Next week. Next week. <laughs> Next week, okay, yeah. maybe I misunderstood it. So is it possible we do, today with all the technology, a kind of a public um, campaign on, with key messages? You know, you wash your hands, 70% uh, of communicable diseases, uh, you know, can be arrested or uh, reduced. Similarly, key five or six messages families and education institutions should have. Is it possible that we do through internet um, a kind of a campaign? The second thing I would say, because international organizations are not uh, providing funding support, not prioritizing mental health, many CSOs are not taking that as a priority. So again, we need to do something, some kind of a data uh, with, uh, with evidence, have some kind of a lobby advocacy with the international. Because when families are under tremendous pressure, they need some kind of a tertiary support. 
you know, Satyamedha Jayate, I saw one episode where uh, Amir Khan was talking about bringing some families, <laughs> having members, uh, you know, having schizophrenic illness. And, and there he was saying, how uh, he was highlighting some of the NGOs who can give a really give a breather to those families. A kind of something like a oasis mm -hmm. where they can take some time off where this person Relief. is taken care mm -hmm. of. So that is something we can really mobilize, mobilize the CSOs working on health and maybe even identify some of those as part of the infrastructure building, some capacity building for CSOs as well. Thank you. I think these are excellent ideas and I think the president of IPS is there and we have other people who are eminent. We should look forward to this kind of work. Future. And lastly, back to you, Dr. Sujaya, you had already given so much information about the government and uh, why it didn't do what it's supposed to do and why it is now in this ambitious plan. So what do you think is the way forward in terms of uh, um, galvanizing government, private, public initiatives and any, any uh, ideas on yeah, I take off from where Dr. Belinda left. You know, see, uh, see, when we talk about mental um, illness, I think it's the families which often suffer more. The caregivers. There is nothing that's there, you know, saying. Mm -hmm. And as Dr. Rao uh, highlighted, I think the, with the uh, joint family system breaking down, which is also another major issue when we talk about healthcare for the elderly, which is there. So for the caregivers, we somehow have forgotten this whole concept. I mean, even when their parents are working or the children are working and if they have to take care, I mean, so the program as the 12th plan when it was visualized, we are talking about daycare centers. Do we have a place where if there isn't anybody, can they go and, you know, leave? This is where see, NGOs have been doing a lot of work, whether it is Sangat in uh, Goa, whether it is Sankir in uh, Meghalaya, where they are taking off and saying. And in the mental health hospitals also, today we say, the policy that is actually the bill, the mental health bill when it is enacted, it says that, you know, see, we do say that people should not be confined to institutions and they need to get. But as Dr. Rajpal highlighted, there will be some chronic cases. That continuum of care which is required throughout the, this thing, lifetime for some people and we say, but how do you, what do you say about people who are just abandoned? Can the society, can government, can institutions leave about it? I've gone to a psychiatric hospital, seen a lady who's been there for the last 50 years. She's happy. That's the only world she has known. She doesn't have anybody to take her. Or in Meghalaya, where from across the border, you have people there. I mean, it's not only just the Indian borders. Hum humane consideration require you cannot leave them out but can we but is it right to keep them in institutions alone are they not supposed to be integrated into society this is where rehabilitation so we are talking of long-term care we are talking about residential care we are talking about day care and long-term care in the 12th plan this policy also highlights, but also say like, uh, let me take the example as a woman and as somebody who's interested in gender issues, the issue of women. See, sometimes a woman is confined to an institution. She has a little child. I mean, do you keep the child in that institution? What happens to that child when it grows up? The mental health care now specifically says that you cannot, but also is the question, if it's a little baby, how can you separate the mother from the child? For some time, you may have to keep it out. So the bill talks about provisions of how that child would be kept away with provisions for the mother to see the child in terms and the kind of, you know, the, the, the uh, psychiatrist or other thing would have to specify, you know, within how many days it has to be there. Also, the time of time to be spent in an institution or in a hospital, these are specified. Also, the issue of, uh, like, uh, if the bill talks about advanced directive. Now, we assume that there is no legal capacity, there is no right for the patient. This is a forward-looking bill. It's a thing. See, India is a signatory to the CRPD. We are supposed to have. Now, we did have a Mental Health Act. I think if it was a, people felt it. Is. So when we began this whole process also, we were not sure. We thought we would need some amendments. But I think has society demanded it, has the association, all stakeholders have now demanded that it should be an entirely revamped act. That is why the government is now coming up with the mental health care bill. 
and we are talking about mental health care. See, and if you look, mental uh, illness has never been defined. This is for the first time it is getting defined in that. We are talking about nominative. We are talking about informed consent. Now, if I'm in a hospital, I need to be operating. This is it. Who's this person who will give the consent? So I can today decide that in case God forbid that if you know something happens to me, what is the kind of treatment I have? You have to respect the rights of the individual. You have to respect the dignity of the person living with mental illness. So that is something that is big that has happened. We are talking about public-private partnership. Now, this is a very cliched term when we talk about it. But see, there are NGOs who are doing a lot of work. So I think government and civil society is saying, now we talk about CSR. Why can't we get work to get CSR funding for this? For mental health issues, why is it not possible? We talked about, uh, see, the, the whole issue of faith healing. Now, faith healing can happen, and uh, you know there are examples and examples. Now, I just talk about the example in Gujarat. There is this Dawa Dua project, where what was traditionally happening was people took them, there's a mazar there, people took them and let them at the mazar. But over a period of time, they have worked with these people, and today it is the Maza people who are ensuring that these people go in. So there is a psychiatrist who's sitting down, there is a psychologist, there is a team that is coming to see. In Madhya Pradesh, you have the Chamatkari uh, temple, where people are chained and left. And you see, you know, and this is situated in such a way, people from Maharashtra bring them and leave it. People from Madhya Pradesh bring and leave across it. The states, to, yeah. Across the state. So how do you do? It's a way, but the belief. You cannot play with people's faith. See, this country is a country of faith also. And like stigma, like you said, it's a spirit. You could say it is a, some um, a, you know, divine intervention that's happening. There is a, But you have to gradually build. And this Dawa Dua project, which is now being studied around, it is an example how you have used the same Maulvis to talk to, convince people to use modern medicine to do that out. So you need to use these kind. We need to uh, ensure that you know we complement each other. Now, Ayush systems are there. Ayush systems may be good for some of this thing. You know, so you need to understand. We have to understand that, yes, it is evidence-based care that we have to provide. That is the right. We have to ensure there is equity in the kind of treatment. There is justice in terms of that. There is inclusion in the terms of the populations covered. Now, whether it's in uh, disaster situations, emergency situations, do we have, say, if, uh, simple thing, is there an ambulance service to take a mentally ill patient to the hospital? We need to ensure. The policy talks about that. So I think it's definitely a way forward. We are, I mean, as a society, we are beginning to recognize internalizing, but though all of us who are working in this area, whether it's in government, whether it's in private, whether it's NGOs, we need to internalize one thing, that is equity, justice, and dignity of persons living with mental illness, and we need to work for that. And society as a whole, family is an important component, you cannot ignore them. And more than the patient, maybe it's the family society, or can we give attention to them? Can we give attention to the caregiver? So these are issues that we need to talk about. And I think today that there is a recognition of these issues that we feel that we need to <coughs> also provide for the caregivers. We also need to provide for, mental, uh, for, the, uh, the, for the mental health of the family members who will be going through a lot of trauma. I think recognition of this is to say that society is moving a step forward. In towards the right direction. We are moving in the right direction, but let us all put our hands together and let us remember that this mental health is a challenge. Like I said, you need oodles of courage, you need to be in it, and you need to bring in everybody together. This is something that nobody can do alone, whether it's the government alone or the private sector alone. We need the government, the private sector, we need the civil society, NGOs, everybody <laughs> to work in saying, and we have to recognize that mental health issues are everybody's problem. It can happen to any of us. So remember that one in four person goes through a mental health issue once in their lifetime. So none of us are free from it. Please remember that you could also cross a Rubicon. You have a duty to be part of this initiative. 
it's it's a calling it's something that you would be happy about please join this uh, challenge please join this thing it is my appeal to all of you present here to carry the message forward and that there should be no stigma about mental health issues mental illness is treatable that is the issue and we need to actually put in money into this they need to and we need to get the corporates on board because there is i mean it is fashionable today india was let me say were an important player in ensuring that mental health was included illnesses was included among the ncds but everybody talks about the glamorous ncds whether it's diabetes whether it is stroke whether it's heart diseases but nobody talks about mental health we are part of it and we cannot it cannot escape all of us are going to have this you know for some time or the other you will face you will either have an anxiety you will either have a depression or anything so none of us are free from it you don't think that you know it is somebody else's problem it is our problem and we have to fight this together and i would request you all to join in this challenge so that we can at least eliminate or mitigate the suffering of so many people that is taking thank, place thank you so much i think dr sujay thank krishna you, has kind of summed up <laughs> the key messages that uh, we all need to take back home i won't say much further but uh, what i gather from today's panel and all of you who have been so patiently sitting here and listening through this is that change is coming it's coming slowly but it's definitely there and we are moving forward there are there is a lot of work to be done the challenges are there but we have some blueprint and uh, some strategies which our esteemed panelists today have given about involving families communities ngos the the corporates the civil society everybody all of us included we are to be taking a keen interest and ownership of our mental health and the mental health of all the people who are close to us whom we love so i'll end the discussion here today and thank all the panelists for such a vibrant contribution and uh, giving us a lot of food for thought